Institute of Transportation Studies YouTube channel, which is linked below. So last fall, we actually did have um, some speakers on a more topic of today, uh, autonomous vehicles. That includes Steve Schladover from UC Berkeley. And I believe that talk is also on our channel. And today we're returning to that subject. So I'm very pleased to welcome Lauren Isaac today. Lauren is the Director of Business Initiatives at Easy Mile, and she was the opening speaker at our downtown Los Angeles forum last month, where we discussed a number of different aspects of what policymakers need to know and do to prepare for the future that includes autonomous vehicles in a number of different modes. You can find all the presentations from that conference on our website. And today, Lauren's going to kind of walk us through and do a little refresher on what she talks about. We'll also have a chance to talk with her and have some questions um, at the end of the session from anyone of the audience that's viewing it live today. Please go ahead and use the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen to put any questions. You will need to be logged into Google to do so, but you should be able to put questions at any point during the presentation and we'll discuss them at the end. So with that, I want to again thank Lauren for her time and let her take it away. Lauren? All right, thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here virtually with everyone. Um, I absolutely love to talk about driverless vehicles. Um, my background in this is that I, I have been working in the transportation industry for my whole career. Um, but a few years ago, I was working at WSP where I developed the guide for local and state governments on how they can plan for driverless vehicles. And a few months ago, I actually started working at Easy Mile, which is a driverless software provider, and um, now actually getting to see things from the provider side of it. So um, first and foremost, I think it's really important that people see my favorite graphic. Um, this, this graphic says driverless cars are closer than they appear. And really, I like to say, if you leave with nothing else from this webinar, I, I hope that's the biggest takeaway, that driverless vehicles um, really are coming. And in fact, this this is a, the cover of Bloomberg Business Week from June 2015, I believe. So this is actually old news. Um, so what I'm planning on talking about today is first just a general overview of driverless vehicles. I like to call it Driverless Vehicles 101. I'll outline what the, our potential future could be with driverless vehicles, say 50 years from now. And then I'll talk about what now. And you'll see uh, on the right of the screen, I have the Easy Mile EZ10. It's our 12 person electric driverless shuttle. Um, and I'll kind of intertwine some, some stories about that vehicle as I go through this presentation. So to begin with, driverless vehicles 101. So first, of course, we have to start with the definition. Uh, the US Department of Transportation defines automated vehicles as a combination of both hardware and software, remote and onboard, that can perform the driving function with or without a human actively monitoring the environment. So this, is, this really means you can start to rethink not just um, how the vehicles are used, but also how the vehicles are designed. And you can see in this picture from Mercedes-Benz, this is a mock-up of what it could look like, but you see a group of people that are sitting facing each other and having a business meeting and looking at screens on the side of the vehicle. Um, so it's, it kind of changes everything about how we think about vehicles. So the other really important definition, the definitional piece of automated vehicles is the, this international standard on levels of automation. So SAE came out with everything from level zero through level five. Level zero means that there's absolutely no automation. So think when cars first came out and a driver needed to literally push the gas when they want to go and push this brake when they want to stop and turn the wheel when they want to turn. So that requires entirely human interaction. Um, all the way up to level five, which is full automation, where you don't need to have the driver involved in all, so the person can literally be sleeping. And then we have the in-between stages where you're starting to see partial levels of automation, and we're seeing a lot of that happening today. So you may have vehicles that have adaptive cruise control, self-parking, um, other, other functions that, that minimize the amount of human interaction, but still requires uh, some level of human response or of involvement in the driving. So. I wanna start by just showing you a quick video um, and ask the question, is this a level five fully automated vehicle? So if you can't see the video, um, oh, and it's going pretty slow, but this, this video is intended to show someone that's asleep behind the wheel. Here you go. Um, it's a person, this was a real video that was taken, it's up on YouTube, and they're in this vehicle, but they are fast asleep, not paying attention to the road. 
while the vehicle continues to travel. So in this case, the question is, is this a level five fully automated vehicle? And going back to the presentation, I will tell you that the answer is no. Um, this is actually really reflective of where we are today. There are cars, there are automakers that are putting out these partially automated features, which are really great in terms of easing our driving burden. Um, and they are important steps on the evolution to, uh, working towards auto fully automated vehicles. But um, it's actually very dangerous because what this person is doing in this video is actually completely illegal. Um, they need to be responsible for what the car is doing and they certainly need to have their hands on their wheel and the feet and their feet ready to go on the gas or the brake. So, um, so the next question is, why should I care about driverless vehicles? Well, first and foremost, safety. So right now, more than 95% of the accidents that happen on our roadways are due to human error. So think drunk driving, distracted driving, speeding. If you eliminate humans from the driving equation, you have the potential to eliminate that many accidents on the roads. The next one is mobility options. And these are kind of classic Google photos where they show a blind person getting into the Google driverless vehicle. But the mobility options are really amazing for disabled, elderly, and youth, people that traditionally would have a harder time getting around. The other piece of mobility options is that driverless vehicles can be integrated into a whole mobility ecosystem um, so that they're well-timed and well-coordinated with other forms of transit. And then ideally, they're also integrated with payment systems so that you can get on, go from one vehicle to another public transit vehicle, and you can do this all through your phone seamlessly, not constantly having different kinds of payment systems for each one. Uh, the potential for reduced car ownership is huge. So imagine if this two-car garage became this, and all of a sudden you have, and it's an Uber or Lyft-like system where you have shared rides where you can actually just summon a vehicle to come and take you to where you're going. I purposely like to show a public agency in, on the screen because I also think it's important to note that these services could be provided by either the public or the private sector. And I think we're gonna see a lot of different business models arise. The next big benefit that could come from driverless vehicles is the, the potential for decreased space dedicated to parking. If we see more of a shared use system, we could see less private vehicle ownership, so less of a need for our, especially in downtowns, but less of a need for space dedicated to housing these vehicles. And finally, reduced greenhouse gas emissions. And it's really important to note that driverless vehicles don't necessarily require electric vehicles, but for the most part, most of the vehicles that are coming out today that are driverless are also electric. So there's a huge potential for reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. So then the big question is, when are they coming? And I used to show a forecast on this slide to show an estimate of when it could be, but frankly, there are so many different forecasts out there and the timeframes are so wide varying that it's kind of hard to pick just one. But what I'll say is that most automakers are saying that they will have level five fully automated vehicles available in the 2018 to 2020 timeframe. I will tell you that's extremely aggressive and it's kind of hard to believe Easy Mile makes level four vehicles, meaning that they're fully driverless vehicles that can operate in a limited environment. So um, think like a geofenced area, whether it's on a, a college campus or um, in the uh, circulating around a, a, a entertainment complex. So, you know, that's something that's here today and it's a pretty big leap to be able to operate everywhere. Um, however, most forecasts estimate that we're gonna see uh, about 30% penetration of level five fully automated vehicles in the 2030 timeframe. Um, some estimates show that not happening until 2070. Um, and then some estimates are really aggressive and some think that we might see fully automated vehicles in the next 10 years. So it's yet to be seen, um, but know that today we're not there yet. So why aren't they here today? You know, one of the reasons is just the readiness of the technology. There are so many different examples of situations that the technology needs to be able to respond to. Um, the other thing, and this is something that the government is grappling it with, is how ready does technology need to be? What determines what is an appropriate level of readiness? The next issue is insurance. The liability question of who's liable if a driverless vehicle hits another driverless vehicle, um, or if a driverless vehicle hits a manual vehicle. The next big issue is regulations, both at the federal level and the state level. It's important that the 
regulations are able to be responsive to this very different technology. And there, there's a lot going on in that space. Um, infrastructure, even though driverless vehicles don't actually rely on any infrastructure to be able to operate, there are some infrastructure changes that will likely be needed. An example could be um, increases in the amount of pickup and drop off space that's needed. These vehicles will likely be bringing people to their destination and then driving off somewhere else to go park. It no longer needs to have the person in the vehicle with them. So that pickup and drop off access is really important. Another big one is parking. Parking could entirely be eliminated or relocated because that vehicle can go and park itself. And then finally, human acceptance. Uh, the question of who would be willing to get into a driverless vehicle? When I ask people in the Bay Area, I get something like 90% of people are willing to hop in. And then when I ask people in Connecticut, I'll get one person in a huge room that's willing to. I mean, it's very, very different across the country, across age groups. Um, so you just never know. So with that, I'm going to jump into the next piece of this presentation, which is on our driverless vision. And for that, I'm going to lay out two scenarios, purposely extreme scenarios of what our world could look like, say, in 50 years when we have entirely driverless vehicles. So for the first scenario, I'd like everyone to imagine I wake up on a Monday morning, I get my kids ready for school, and then I summon our private driverless vehicle to come pick them up and drive them to school. So while the vehicle is off doing that, I finish getting ready and then I, that vehicle comes back in time to take me to work. So I get into the vehicle I, and it starts driving me to my office downtown. Um, I'm actually sitting in traffic for most of this, but I don't really care because it's, it's doing its thing while I'm able to do whatever I want. I don't need to pay attention to driving. So first I hop on the elliptical trainer and I get my workout in. Um, then I sit back and I have some coffee while I watch the big screen TV on the back of, this, of, the, TV, of the vehicle. Um, and then I realize that some significant amount of time has gone by, so I'm going to start my work day. So eventually I do get to the office. I get in. And before my vehicle leaves, I realized that I actually forgot to get groceries for that evening. So I use my smartphone and I tell my vehicle to go run three errands for me. First, it goes to the local grocery store where there's the cheapest produce. Then it goes to another one where it's the cheapest meat. And then it goes to another uh, stop to go get the cheapest toilet paper. And then when it's done running all of those errands, it goes and sits in a remote parking lot about 15 miles away. So, so that's scenario one. Um, a lot of people would describe that as their dream scenario since that vehicle is now running all of their errands for them. Um, however, in my opinion, it's actually our nightmare scenario, because imagine if that vehicle, you'll notice that that driver never used public transit, but they also were making single occupancy vehicle trips and many, many zero occupancy vehicle trips. So you're talking about a lot of added vehicle miles traveled or VMT on our roadways. So now I'm going to talk through the second option, and this is um, another cool picture of our easy tens in operation. So um, imagine the same thing. I wake up on a Monday morning, I get my kids ready for school, and then the driverless school bus shows up to take them in. So they get on there and they go. And then when I'm finished getting ready, I use my smartphone and I summon one of these easy tens to pick me up and take me to the local train station. So two minutes later, the vehicle shows up. I hop in, it picks up a couple of my neighbors on the way, and then we arrive at the train station. It's perfectly timed. It gets there with just enough time so that I can get on the train. I never take out my wallet. The whole thing is paid for seamlessly. And that train takes me downtown. And then once I get downtown, I hop into another EZ10 and I take that for the last mile to get to my office. So then once I'm in my office, I similarly realize that I forgot to get groceries for that evening. So I use my smartphone and I schedule a delivery for that evening. So that's the, that's the exact same scenario, but the real difference between these two scenarios is the level of ride sharing that's happening. Um, so what I want to do is just compare each of these two scenarios really quickly. So in both cases, safety has improved, and that's because it's a fully driverless society, so we're going to see huge improvements in safety. Um, with, with regards to vehicle miles traveled, absolutely in scenario number one, we're going to see a huge increase in vehicle miles traveled. In scenario number two, there is likely going to be still be an increase, even without the ride sharing, but it's going to be way less than scenario number one. For greenhouse gas emissions, I like to put question marks here for both of them because there is no guarantee that driverless vehicles are going to be electric. Um, with regards to urban sprawl, it is there's a huge risk in that first scenario that people are going to be willing to live much farther from where they work just because 
their value of time and their vehicle has changed so much. Um, versus in scenario two, the idea is that we build much more dense urban cities with great transportation options in those areas, so urban sprawl will be reduced. For the next piece, parking requirements. So for scenario number one, in theory, there will be no change because people will continue to own vehicles in the exact same way that they do today. The only difference is actually the potential change in location of parking requirement of parking. So imagine people may not need to have driveways with, with parking garages in their houses. They could actually keep their car parks 15 miles away in a remote parking lot, and they can use that space that they own in their house somewhere differently. And that same goes for in downtowns that all of that parking could actually be relocated. It just means you're gonna have a lot of added VMT to get the vehicles to and from there. For scenario two, on the other hand, parking requirements could go way down because we have shared fleets that are moving around a lot more so they don't need to be parked as much and each person doesn't have their own vehicle. And then finally, when it comes to low income mobility, in that first scenario, it could get way worse because in theory, public transit could even go away. Whereas in the second scenario, public transit could actually be really, really rich and reliable in that dense urban area and you could see great improvements for low income mobility. So the vision, and this is actually a big reason why I joined Easy Mile, is that we take our urban environments today and we kind of reclaim that space. So we have improved safety, we're able to use our roads more efficiently and able to enjoy our cities more. So that, that is really the goal and the idea is you know, to push more towards that second scenario. So which brings us to what now, what can we do now? Um, well, I just wanted to acknowledge where we're at right now that with the revolution that's happening around shared vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and electric vehicles, and to see those all come together and really reap the benefits of those, the question is what, what do we need to do to make that happen? So um, I, this is the list of some policies that I think are so important to consider. Um, the first one is around updating roadway policies to manage that vehicle miles traveled impact. So, Implementing things like high occupancy vehicle lanes and road user charging, it's gonna be real important to have people um, feel the impacts of how much they are putting their vehicles on the road. The second one is to adjust land use policies to reduce urban sprawl. The third one is to actually adjust the, um, I'm moving my thing over, adjust the tax and fee structure to disincentivize car ownership and parking. And I would say the opposite, or you can incentivize not owning a car or incentivize ride sharing. But the idea is to either increase those parking fees or parking taxes or increase the sales tax on vehicles so that people are less incentivized or less likely to want to own their car or park their vehicle. Um, the next one is to alter parking policies to reduce the need for private parking. So it could be changing zoning requirements and we're seeing that around the country right now where there are no minimum zoning requirements that a new apartment needs to put you know, a minimum amount of, amount of parking spaces. Um, the next one is around incentivizing electric usage and ownership. So this could be everything from uh, putting better electric vehicle infrastructure in our cities, um, giving better benefits to people that buy or lease electric vehicles, um, anything to actually just incentivize that, that um, adoption. And then finally, change transit pricing. So driverless vehicles can be seen as a competitor to transit. I don't like to think of it that way. I like to think of it more like driverless vehicles are part of this ecosystem and they need to work together really well. So the idea is to charge for transit in a way that it's competitive and, and really works well within that system. And the example that I like to give is a few years ago when I was living in San Francisco, Uber did a Match Muni campaign and they were charging $2.25, the exact same price of transit of using Muni. And when that happened, as you can imagine, a lot of people used Uber instead of using Muni. Well, imagine over the next many years when fleets of vehicles are introduced and um, these fleet owners no longer have to pay drivers, the price of those trips is going to be very, very low. So we need to make sure that transit stays an important player in our mobility ecosystem. Um, and next one. So one of the key recommendations I really tell everyone to do is to start a pilot. And these are just a handful of the reasons why pilots can be so, so valuable. Um, there are so many good reasons to educate stakeholders, figure out how to navigate the regulations as they stand today, the insurance requirements as they stand today, just get it out there and help people understand what it takes to bring dri shared driverless vehicles um, to our society. And, and in that regard, I think it's also important that we don't just introduce driverless vehicles for the sake of introducing them. 
technology is really great, but it's it's only it's only valuable when it's actually solving a problem. So what kind of mobility challenges can we address with shared electric automated vehicles? And these are just a handful of examples of use cases where Easy Mile is operating the EZ10. And I think it's important to see how like at train stations, you could provide first and last mile solutions. At airports, you can be shuttling people from their gates to the, the baggage area. Um, and the list goes on. There are so many great opportunities. And I think it's important that we just remember to use technology responsibly. So um, with that, I will end and look forward to hearing questions from the audience. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, that was always a great opportunity to kind of talk through the problems that we're dealing with in this area. So I wanna start with a couple of questions before we get back to the audience. But thank you for anyone that, that joined us late and feel free to ask questions you might already address. We can, we can come back to them. So let's talk about this idea of kind of where you end on, which is starting a pilot. So can you talk about a mobility challenge that Easy Mile is currently tackling with one of your pilot projects? Yeah, I mean, I think one of our biggest challenges right now is with, with regards to regulations. Um, it's, it's a challenge because I believe very strongly that government has requirements and, and oversees you know, anything that's put into our public roadways to make sure that they're safe. But at the same time, you don't wanna be restrictive. And what's happening right now at the federal level is the federal government is trying to navigate how they can appropriately regulate this technology, but also not get in the way of it. And as it stands, our vehicles, and this is true for, for all of the driverless vehicles that are comparable to ours, um, are not compliant with the federal motor vehicle safety standards. And which makes sense. They are very heavy, but they're very slow moving vehicles. They're not a golf cart, but they're also not a, a bus. So um, right now we actually have to apply for an exception to be able to operate in the United States. And, and that's reasonable, but, and the federal government has been great about working with us. Um, but um, there are still a lot of requirements that come with doing an exception. And so that, and then you look at the state level, at the state level, we're dealing with different regulations place to place, and these are changing every day. I mean, Colorado just passed a law around AVs yesterday, and there are regulations and works around the country. So it's it's a challenge to keep up with them and also make sure that we are deploying things legally. I mean, that's something we, along with everybody, wants to do, um, but also keep up with the regulations. So I'd say that's probably our biggest challenge right now. Mm -hmm. So if you were to get through that, um, what would be a particular scenario that you might want to um, pilot the, the easy vehicle shuttles at um, that, that could potentially kind of test some of this technology? Yeah, well, I'll give two examples that we're actually um, in the process of doing right now. Um, one of our vehicles is in the Bay Area. It's up at Bishop Ranch, which is an employment center. And the vehicle is what it's going to be doing is circulating around the entire employment site. So it'll be helping to bring employees from place to place. It's a gigantic employment center. Um, the other example we have is in the city of Arlington, Texas. Um, we have two vehicles there. They're going to be deployed in the next month. And they are going to be transporting people from the sports complex to a parking lot. So it's, it's a great solution where, you know, these vehicles, they're relatively slow right now. Even though they can operate up, up to 25 miles an hour, Usually we have them operating around 10 to 12 miles an hour. And that's, that's pretty slow, I mean, and, and safe. I mean, I think if we think about a, a bicyclist is maybe traveling at about 12 miles an hour. So it's yeah, very it's cold. cold. <laughs> but it's amazing how many use cases there are where it actually is solving a problem. So for example, in this Arlington example, you know, actually walking about a mile, that's a pretty long distance for quite a few people, especially when you're looking at people with mobility it uh, challenges uh, our vehicle has an automatically deploying wheelchair ramp which is also great for accessibility reasons um so if you look at that if you look at college campuses um if you look like i said at airports um elderly um homes there there are a lot of places where that short distance is enough of a challenge where it's actually helping to make a difference mm -hmm. so wh why do, why do the vehicles move so slow um, I mean, safety, that's the biggest reason, that's the number one reason. And I think over time they're going to get faster. And if anything, I think it shows the state of the technology right now when you imagine that a lot of the OEMs are putting 
they're trying to test the vehicles to be able to be level five fully automated and the technology really isn't there yet to be able to operate at those fast speeds in urban environments where you have a lot of unpredictable situations. So for us, the speed is really dictated by the complexity of the situation. We can go faster in places where we have less mixed traffic um, and less complexity like that. Mm -hmm. But it seems like the problem, you're not trying to solve the problem of getting places faster, but rather to kind of bring distances closer together with some type of link between them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I think it's a matter of picking uh, places that make sense where that distance isn't so long that people are just, you know, too frustrated. They don't want to sit in there while, you know, it travels eight miles at 10 miles an hour. You know, I mean, it has to be something you're actually solving a problem for people. Yeah, so um, speaking of other problems, you know, we we're talking a bit about the autonomous technology and levels of automation. But what we didn't kind of talk about, uh, or you didn't talk about yet, was about connectivity. So can you talk a little bit about infrastructure outside of, you know, charging infrastructure that would be needed for electric vehicles, but the types of connected infrastructure that a city might want to um, consider installing or being think about that could actually really get us towards the benefits you outlined for the automation? Yeah, so there are really a pretty large host of connected vehicle options. Um, vehicles, there's vehicle to vehicle technology where vehicles can speak to each other and that obviously doesn't involve any city infrastructure. Um, and then there's vehicle to infrastructure technology where the vehicles can communicate with traffic signals or with the roadway. Say if there's a really steep turn, the vehicle can, you know, communicate with that. Um, I would say for us that our number one focus is on the vehicle to traffic signal communication. Um, you know, even though autonomous vehicles do not require any infrastructure investments, you're really going to reap the most benefits if you maximize both connected and automated vehicle technology. So we are building into our technology the ability, ability for the vehicles to communicate with traffic signals so that they can actually, there's that communication so the vehicle knows like, oh, it's about to turn green, I can keep going. Mm -hmm. So is that like a radio signal or what really is the, the thing that, that would get changed out in the signals in this scenario? Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's um, I'm not a technical person, so I'm not the one to tell you the details on that, but um, there's, there's a very specific technology to be able to communicate with DSRC, dedicated short range communications, um, that a lot of cities around the country are already installing um, for communication even with manual vehicles. So it's not specific to the driverless technology. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it'll, that'll be a really interesting thing to watch is, is how, you know, can the future improvements that will be supportive of this also just kind of update our infrastructure in general, right? Like, we can't have smart cars operating with dumb technology that just really won't get us there. Um, yeah. But to yeah. figure out what kind of steps along the way, like, oh, if you're already installing them, or I mean, you know, my, my thing would be as, as someone that's more interesting in traffic calming, like, oh, maybe we can go to roundabouts, you know, as a way to not even deal with kind of the signal part in certain areas as well. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah and, there, and there are some infrastructure changes like um, the, you know, in the long term, we might be able to reduce the width of roadways because these driverless vehicles um, don't need the same amount of wiggle room that humans need for the error that we, we have to deal with. So in theory, the width of roadways could be reduced. Um, but I, I would be the first to tell cities I would not make that change until we're at that point with the technology. That's, that's something we do uh, that as a city, we would want to see happen more reactively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of um, thought about there just about even right now with the technology in terms of the vehicles that we have, that many places the roadway is, is already kind of oversized and it's not necessarily to try to, you know, drastically change, but can you take a 15 foot lane down to a 12 foot lane and, um, you know, create yeah. some buffer for the sidewalk or a planting strip or a way that you can have, you know, at intersections, maybe reduce the width so that we're using crossing distances. But just what are kind of all of the little spaces that we might, you know, future also be supportive of this, but they can also kind of go towards the goals that we're trying to reach now um, for yeah, just having absolutely. a safe system, you know, and, today. And replace right? some of, use some of that land for the cycling infrastructure, you know, or more pedestrian space. I mean, it's really about having the city envision what they want their future to be, and then leverage technology to be able to help them get there. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. 
So I think one thing that struck me during your presentation was you had this the slide about kind of establishing supportive policies. And a lot of the things you outline are, are policies that cities and regions are already kind of trying to do now, like, um, you know, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and try to curb and, and limit urban growth in a way that is focused and targeted. Um, what, why do we think that this new technology is going to mean anything different from the progress we're trying to do now? Yeah. No, it's a really great question. In fact, when I was studying all of this and I was looking at driverless vehicles, I realized that when I looked at these list of policy recommendations, that there was absolutely nothing in there that was specific to driverless vehicles. Those were all, like you said, policy initiatives that can and should happen today, but they're not necessarily. And that's because a lot of them are really hard to do. I mean, road user charging is a very, very complex thing and extremely, you know, especially initially, extremely unpopular when you ask just a regular person, would you want to have a road user charge? Um, the one thing I will say is that I think the driverless technology presents an incredible opportunity to introduce these policies because the driverless technology is so new. So you could, in theory, a city could introduce road user charging and say just for driverless vehicles because it's brand new. No one, no one has had their driverless vehicle operating and doing it for free for years and years. I mean, that's, that's the challenge is that if you have your own vehicle and all of a sudden you start getting charged completely differently, you're going to be upset about it. But if you have a driverless vehicle and you just purchased it or you just started using it as part of a shared fleet, the pricing structure is gonna be brand new to you. So it's a great opportunity for politicians to be able to introduce these more challenging policies. Um, I will just say a lot of states right now, I shouldn't say a lot, I think at least four or five are piloting road user charging. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, I think there's a growing recognition that the fuel tax is not a sustainable way to fund transfer, fund infrastructure. And that, you know, it's also, it doesn't make sense as we move towards more towards electric vehicles. Um, so it's gonna be an even more declining revenue source. So um, road user charging for so many reasons is really important. And I think driverless vehicles are just a great way to introduce them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you can you can consider it as kind of like a policy window in a way. Is that yeah? I mean, exactly. in some ways, it it could be a little discouraging. I think if you're a if you're someone that's been in the field and has maybe committed your career to trying to do this, <laughs> and you, you know, spent you know untold hours testifying to say this is good, this is right, and it's like, okay, well now why all of a sudden do we get this? But rather than to be cynical about that, how can we actually think about this as, as you mentioned, as an opportunity or kind of as this window to say, well, really now's the time, if, you know, mm -hmm. there was a, you know, there, you know, the same kind of barriers still withstanding, but here's an opportunity. Let's try this. Let's pilot. This. Yeah. And I think the challenge with all of this is that all of it requires um, the public agencies to be really proactive because what we in theory would not want to see happen is that driverless vehicles just appear overnight and all of a sudden you have every single person owns them the way that we own cars today and you just have to see a massive increase in traffic and then government is in this very reactive position of having to you know put policies in place and taxes and fees or whatever it is to try and manage that in a reactive way i think in an ideal world you would have a city look at their future and say, what are our long-term goals? What would we want our city to look like? And then what can we do today to work towards that? And there's an awesome phrase that I heard called backcasting. And it is the idea that you come up with a vision, come up with a roadmap for that, but acknowledge that things are gonna change along the way um, and, and build your plan based on that, as opposed to what we've been doing in a more traditional planning sense, which is to look at the past 20 or 30 years and then build off of that. I think there's general acknowledgement that our, our planning that's happened in the past is not necessarily a good representation of what we're going to see in the future because technology is changing so quickly. I mean, if you look at our plans, no one predicted Uber 10 years ago. And meanwhile, that's been transformative for our cities. So today we're starting to see this introduction of driverless vehicles. And in fact, public agencies have the blessing of knowing that they're coming and knowing they can start planning for them now because there is this kind of ramp up that's happening. Um, but there is going to be more and more technology that comes that's really very hard to predict. So I think there's lots of good opportunity now. Like you said, we're going to take the positive spin on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in, in the trouble I think in this and um, I think we brought up at the conference is that when you're doing that forecasting, it's very difficult where you can say, okay, the change factor is just this technology, 
but that also assumes that nothing else is going to change, right? The, the urban form we have now is going to kind of stay the same and that it's only one actual thing that's changing when in fact, we really probably should even think about a few different scenarios at least that really not only the technology is changing, but other conditions that we see now might change as well. And that there's probably some um, kind of intertwining and in different relationships if you also predict a slightly different future of what we have. Yeah, I mean, that's that's partially why I lay out those two scenarios and they're very extreme. And I'm the first to say that we're not going to end up with either one of those totally extreme scenarios. Um, I don't think, I hope anyway, that public transit will not entirely disappear. Um, and I don't think that every single person is going to use a shared fleet and never, you know, send a vehicle out on a single or zero occupancy vehicle trip. But for the sake of scenario planning, I think it is important to think through those extreme scenarios just to see, put some bounds on it, you know, just to see what could happen in those extreme scenarios. And then, and then work backwards from that, because you might see, you know, looking at those extremes that we maybe don't need to build that new um, um, road extension or extra lane on that road or building that parking garage doesn't make sense right now. Or maybe we build it, but we build it in a very flexible way so that um, it can be changed into an apartment complex later on if we don't need that parking. So just think about things with a little more flexibility. Um, I think that's really the benefit of scenario planning, just like bending your mind. And the tricky thing is today's travel demand models, what our, what our city planners are using, um, there are so many assumptions in those that are starting to get really challenged. You know, like, like the person's value of time when they're driving, well, that's gonna completely change. And those are fixed things in the model right now. So um, I know that travel demand modelers throughout the country and really around the world are starting to reevaluate what, how they do travel demand modeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's um, totally kind of switching to a slightly different topic. Let's talk okay. a little bit about um, something that was kind of in the news today about these pilots, as we heard kind of a bit of a, a fizzle of the relationship between Pittsburgh and Uber and their kind of pilots. And it seemed to be the narrative that, you know, that really Pittsburgh wasn't really getting the um, benefits that they thought they would and that relationship seems to be suffering a little bit so in your role kind of on the private side what type of things would you maybe you know advise that a city really ask for um, or how can you know future pilots not succumb to the same type of troubles that we're seeing in that example yeah i mean there are so many things to say about that one <laughs> um so, I mean, first of all, I would tell a public agency to first figure out what are their goals in bringing this technology to their city. Um, you know, and I, I actually don't know what Pittsburgh's goals were with this. Um, and But I, I'm not to say they don't have them. I just personally don't know. But to help the city really think through what are they trying to accomplish and then make sure that they're communicating that to any private partners that they have. Um, I think that's really important. I can tell you from the Easy Mile perspective, we, we always talk to our client about what they're trying to accomplish. In some case, you know, it's all about just building public awareness and just getting the technology out there so that the adoption will be easier over the coming years. Um, in other places they want, their goal is to navigate the regulations because it's really complex in their state or their goal is there's a specific mobility problem. There are people that are not be, don't have a mobility solution to get from point A to point B and they wanna make sure they're getting that. So figure out what those goals are and then figure out metrics to make sure that you're actually doing that. Is it just the number of people that you're getting on the vehicle? Is it the number of people that are no longer complaining about a lack of mobility problems? Um, is it the success of navigating either the regulatory environment or the liability insurance environment? Um, so outlining what those are, figuring out what the metrics are, and then really committing to tracking them. And I think the challenge with the Pittsburgh Uber example is as far as I know, there was no financial exchange. There was no contractual relationship there. So there was a question of, can they be good partners? And I, I don't know the nature of the relationship, but I, I think, you know, it would be my advice for any public agency would be to really set a goal of, you know, this is what I would love to see come out of you before you actually allow them to come into your city. Um, because in the end, the private companies, they, they have their goals and they're going to, you know, ultimately try and make money doing it. Um, so the question is, how can you find ways that can be mutually beneficial? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, I just think it's really important that um, these are proactive discussions. I think that's really the best thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that the there's, it, it wasn't, the, the, the 
selection of Pittsburgh as this test case was not just random, right? Like it was for particular reasons. They have a particularly hilly environment. There's mm -hmm. snow. And then you also have obviously the um, university. Like the university connection, but you know, that that part of it. So to, to think that to, for cities maybe to remember that you actually hold a lot of power that like, you know, they, these companies are probably coming to you for a reason. It's not like they just threw an arrow at a map. It's like, okay, Austin is yeah. going to pass, right? Yeah, so, so true. To, yeah. So to remember yeah. that to your advantage and say like, we're actually bringing you a lab. Like you can't, you know, there is the, obviously that test bed um, in Contra Costa County, but that's a pretty rare case where you have this closed loop environment that can exist. It's also like federal lands. You don't have to deal with state regulations. Like that's a very unique opportunity. More yeah. so these pilots are probably going to look more like Pittsburgh where they just want to test like all the different kind of um, elements that you described, right? So they yeah. just remember that you have power, like that you're, you're bringing a place to them. And I totally agree. And such an important thing that government agencies also often forget is how much they have to offer in all of this. So I think that's important. Yeah. So let's take um, some time and see if there's any questions from the audience. Um, don't actually have that open. So we're gonna ask for our assistant to see if there's any questions going on here. Yes, we got yeah. Um, land use ones. I mean, I think any form of urban growth boundaries, any kind of um, just minimizing where development can go um, and making sure that you maximize, you know, the zoning that you have and, and the land that you have in your dense urban areas. Most, most forecasts actually say that something like 70% of our population is going to live in cities over the next 50 years. So, um, I think, you know, that's working in our favor, but the more that we put, you know, good schools, invest in good schools and good other like city support um, agencies in the dense urban areas, I think the better off we'll be. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I think transit agencies actually have a really important role in this. And, and I think the biggest challenge they face is that they have a changing role. So traditionally, they have owned and operated all of their vehicles. And there really hasn't, you know, besides the private vehicle, those were the only kind of uh, competing options. Maybe had taxis, public transit systems, and then personal vehicle. And today that is completely thrown off. I mean, now you have all these private companies that are getting into this space. So you have the Ubers and Lyfts of the world, you have Chariot, um, and then you have ride sharing companies, car sharing companies, um, carpooling apps. So this, the mobility ecosystem is truly that. It's no longer just a black and white thing. And the players are so diverse um, that transit agencies, I think they need to rethink their role so that they are more of a mobility aggregator than they are necessarily the operator. So instead of thinking of themselves as competition with like a car sharing company and a ride sharing company, I think thinking of them as being an information source, starting to think through how can we actually get more towards the phrase mobility as a solution, um, MOS, the idea that you have an integrated fair payment system amongst all of these. I mean, that's I think those are all the things that contribute towards scenario number two. So just thinking about, you wanna encourage shared rides. So what is the pricing that we need to do that? What is the information that people need to do that? And then what can we do to enable that? So transit agencies um, really should think through, you know, what, where are the services most needed that the private companies are not providing it? So look at those lower density areas that maybe have low income people and make sure they still have mobility options. Um, but then also make sure that you're, providing the right opportunities amongst the, the more dense areas um, so that you're not duplicating service necessarily, but that you're just providing good seamless opportunities for getting around so that people don't assume that they have to use their own vehicle. Maddie, you're nodding. Do you want to add to that? <laughs> 
I mean, I'm just like, yeah, I just agree. Um, that's part of it. <laughs> yeah, it's, we're, we're seeing a lot of these examples um, in Los Angeles. So there's a federal pilot, a mobility on demand pilot, the LA Metro is going to be participating in. And the other thing, just thinking about integration, we have it actually another unique um, kind of organizational example in Los Angeles where uh, the bike share system is actually run by the transit operator. And right now you can use your tap card, like our fare payment um, to access that, but it's not entirely integrated, but that's re what they're working towards is really, you know, an integrated um, system, I think fare payment. So to think about, you know, that if the goal of getting there is an integrated on-demand service, what can you just be doing with your existing assets to try to test this out, right? Because it's going to be, it's obviously difficult in the future, but now with the assets that you do control, you can start to kind of test this and figure out the integration part. Because it's, you know, from an outsider point of view, it's like, oh, it just seems very obvious. Like I should be able to get off the bus and then the way that I transfer onto a train should be the same way I transfer onto a bike share. But, you know, really talking through the people, it's, as everything not everything's as easy as it seems but yeah. so what can we use kind of existing we want to get towards this on-demand mobility service that will then actually set the stage for then the connected and automated vehicles as well yeah yeah so other questions from the audience if not i can go through a couple others i have mm -hmm. okay so um well, let's kind of take a step back and you start talking about this in terms of the land use regulations that to say, um, you know, what other things might change? You talk about schools. So, but just, you know, what are, are there other things besides just land use that might change with the future technology, um, you know, kind of maybe out within or outside of transportation? Yeah, I mean, I I think um, the amount of impacts that driverless vehicles could have could be enormous for a lot of different industries. One of my favorite someone once pointed out to me when I was giving a talk somewhere is they said, well, think about organ donors. If we have so much of a safer society, we might have a lot less organs available because there will be less accidents. And how is that going to impact the health of, of you know, people that, that re rely on health or organ transplants? So, I mean, that's, that's a very extreme one, but very real. Um, and on, in that same regard, you know, the amount of money that the government and the private sector spends on dealing with car accidents is actually really large. The incident response, you know, having ambulances available, having the hospital systems available. I mean, those are all kind of trickling effects that come from a reduction in accidents. Um, but another one would be the, the way that our, our stores change. I mean, think about, you know, traditionally we drive or take a, a bus or get somehow get to a store and you go in and you go shopping and then you leave. But, you know, in that first scenario I outlined, you could have your vehicle go and run errands for you, and then stores would need to have the ability to load a car with the appropriate things that were purchased, and then that vehicle would then need to know to go and come back. So it's like how we think about brick and mortar stores and the service they provide would probably change a good amount. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you see that already with kind of the Amazon delivery, like, you know, Amazon On Demand or Amazon Fresh? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, all of that, it's kind of like all of these things are all percolating towards, you know, how are they going to leverage the driverless technology to be able to do all of those deliveries and, and incorporating in like drones and sidewalk delivery robots and, you know, all of these things. It's all kind of like everyone's trying the different technologies to see how the market can handle them. And I, I think it's all going to just cause like a massive shift in how we do purchasing and shopping um, and it'll be interesting to see there are some things you probably still just need to go to the store for. I mean, I've been, I've been going to Home Depot a lot and Home Depot, I, I can't imagine how you would replace that with a drone. <laughs> um, it was so doing a lot of trips back and forth to get you the right lumber. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and then, I mean, another one is um, um, auto repair services and gas stations. I mean, they're there are so many um, pieces of our infrastructure. And, you know, another piece is the trucking industry. And that's um, that's probably an industry that's going to be affected the soonest from the driverless technology. Um, they have a lot to gain because they have a shortage in drivers. Um, and they also, um, any opportunity for them to save money is huge because they have it's a low margin business. So um, if you combine the connected and automated technology for the trucking industry, 
Um, these vehicles can be platooned. You could maybe have one driver for that's able to cover all of the vehicles or someday even none. Um, but there's a full industry in the United States that revolves around the trucking industry, not just the trucker jobs, but also the rest stops and all of the hotels that support truckers that are traveling. Um, and there are estimates about, you know, the millions of dollars that will be lost due to the automation of the trucking technology. Um, I will just say, I think that there are, there's a balance with all of that. I think there's going to be, first of all, I think it'll be a while before the actual trucking jobs um, go away. Because right now the technology is really focused on those long hauls. You still need a driver to handle um, that first last mile piece when the vehicle gets off the highway. Um, but all of these things, it's kind of yet to be seen, but they will, there will be big impacts. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the, it, even in one industry that's illustrative, it's not going to just go one way. I mean, I think that there's, you know, there was a whole NPR so, uh, series about kind of the future of automation and what jobs are um, kind of protected from automation. And I think that there's a reaction to say, oh, with autonomous um, trucks, particularly, all those jobs will go away. But that the, what you said first, that we have a trucking shortage is not very um, evident to people. And that the job, the trucking jobs that exist now are kind of are, are tough jobs. They're tough on yeah. public health. So to the extent that, um, you know, that some of the stress, like you mentioned earlier, can be taken off. I mean, hopefully it's also just slightly better for kind of human health of the people that are in that industry now as well. Yeah. And I would be the first to tell you, if you had a kid that was trying to pick a career, I would say probably don't go into the truck driving career because <laughs> that is something that, that may or may not be there in 20 or 30 years. But if you're a truck driver that's been doing it for years and you know you want to keep doing it, they you'll probably still have a job for many years to come. So um, I think that's just how we need to think of it. Like, you know, you you have to think about the longevity of some of these jobs. And yeah, listen to that NPR <laughs> uh, talk about, uh, you know, jobs that are impacted by automation, because I think it's not going to happen overnight, but we can see signs of where it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Totally. So we're, we're about at the end. I think you had a video you wanted to show to close us out. Yeah, I'm hoping it'll work. I, I'm not sure if um, the vehicle, if the videos were coming through. I, so this is um, this is actually like a news story about our city of Arlington pilot. So I'm gonna hit play on this now. It's just two minutes long. So I think we might not be getting the sound if there is some, but. Oh, really? Yeah. And so there we go. An autonomous um, vehicle called Easy Mile. It's a little shuttle that um, is meant to provide kind of first mile, last mile transportation between destinations. This technology is to bring the technology on open roads with mixed traffic in order to uh, deliver last mile applications. Uh, for example, we want to uh, bring people from a parking lot to a shopping malls. Uh, here we are close to two main uh, main stadiums, so the idea would be to bring people from the parking lots, which would be uh, away from the stadiums, to the stadiums or on day match, for example. It's doable, it's real, and look what it saves. I mean, it's all program, and you feel completely excited. Excited is the word I would use, and I think all of our citizens are any of our visitors come to Arlington are going to find a new experience, which is really exciting. The mayor and council appointed a transportation advisory committee, and this technology that we're piloting today is a great example of some of the different types of technology that that committee will be looking to as they're starting to develop recommendations for Arlington's transportation plan in the future. It should be no surprise that Arlington wants to be on the cutting edge of whatever is going on and especially now we are seeing a transformation in technology and so we want to investigate try it out and see what may work i don't know where it may go but uh, the opportunities are endless well i think i would echo the the sentiments of many people in that video to say this is very exciting um 
But as, as you mentioned earlier, I think as a parting uh, remark is to say, don't, it's not just the excitement alone, right? We can't just do this because it's the next coolest thing. So really to think through what are the problems you're trying to solve and then how can this cool thing actually do that? So yes. awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. And thanks for everyone that um, tuned in today and we'll see you on our next webinar. Thank you.